Greetings, friends. Was communism really that bad? I do not joke here. I do not speak in jest. Although I have, I'm not a communist, I'm willing to hear the other side of the story, to look at the nuance, and there's a number of uh, Russians in my church, of course, because I go to a, a Rokor church. Some of them are immigrants from before the Soviet Union collapsed. Some of them may have come afterwards. And a number of them will claim that communism was good, that communism was positive. They are perhaps not the majority of people, but they are a significant number. I can't say exactly how many there are. Some people would have come as children, as immigrants, it wouldn't have been their decision. You might call the hypocrites those who are in the West, uh, enjoying the benefits of the West, or having fled uh, challenges in the Soviet Union. In that case, maybe they are hypocrites. But in other cases, they might have come over after the Soviet Union collapsed, which of course the West had a role in precipitating and therefore because of economic troubles and other problems they it was no longer the same place for them so from that logic you can see well you know they may have come to the west but they still have this memory of a better time and maybe some people's childhood was happy memories in a communist country it could be so i'm not discounting that there are these people and you also hear them among serbians talking about the former yugoslavia many of them are like communism was better and they, they mention social goods social security. I'm not going to get into this discussion of was communism economically viable or not or how great the social benefits were because other people have discussed those matters already. I will say that I'm going to be a bit vague between the Soviet Union and communism, partly out of necessity, but sometimes you have to make a distinction like in Vietnam through the Chinese communists, so that's an even more weak example of communism from the Soviet Union. The normal things to discuss are like, well, guaranteed jobs, less chance of being homeless, I guess, and you would have guaranteed holidays and other social benefits. The economic arguments are like, well, Neil Ferguson or other Western historians are like, well, the Russians couldn't make good pair of jeans. They couldn't sell their product. And indeed, they couldn't participate in the propaganda war the way Hollywood could. That is something they were never able to do. So who knows the truth of whether the Soviet, you know, the Soviet system was doomed to collapse economically? I don't know. Obviously, they made concessions here and there. They didn't stay true to pure Marxism. We can agree on that. Obviously, Stalin would have made exceptions. And then they didn't stay true to true Marxist ideology either. I think Stalin would have recognized the value of the family unit, at least by the 50s, before he passed. and. and the, communists did try to uh, preserve the family unit and they didn't go into degeneracy like we see with uh, all the different colorful marches today and all of that ideology and feminism though having Marxist roots never really took on in Russia at least Russia the way that it did in the West or any of the former Soviet bloc countries or any of the former communist countries not even China has something like feminism if anything the opposite <laughs> In China, where males are like ma the male child is like overly favored by the parents, but perhaps it was the Russian people, the spirit of them, with their perseverance, their thousand-year history, their strong Orthodox faith, the resilience in facing down invaders numerous times successfully, driving them from their lands. Perhaps it was the spirit of the Russian people and their deep soul, which you see in their folk music, particularly, and then their aspirations for high culture, that persevered and overcame communism, and perhaps blended, well, not blended, but overpowered the Soviet regime. Because towards the end, I'm pretty sure the high culture was funded by the regime. If someone who's more of a historian, they can fill me in on the details. But it's not like... The Soviets were putting on these great, great shows and these orchestras and all these productions without funding it. And it's not like all the people participating in it were being forced to be there. The urban classes in America or Canada or the West, we would go to the cinema or the, or the, the shopping mall. But in Russia today, people will go in the cities to museums, to art galleries, 
to opera and orchestra. But the point about my church is that's where I started to hear, like, some of them have this opinion of communism, but it wouldn't have been the founders of the parish, because my church was founded by people who fled the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was officially atheist and persecuted people who openly practiced, especially Orthodox Christianity. So it was people like that that, that came to the West, came to Toronto, and founded the parish around the 1960s, around that time. That was the beginning of the parish. So I don't know what those people would have thought, how they would have spoken of communism in, in positive terms. Maybe it would have meant something differently for them. I think for people later on, like the East Germans, there are East Germans you can find today where like they preferred things before the unification of Germany. There are some East Germans who will tell you this today. And I'm somewhat skeptical of the stories we hear of East Germans trying to escape into the West. I'm sure there were those numbers of East Germans that tried to do it, climbing over the wall or taking a hot air balloon over the wall. But am I so sure to agree that there was just this overflood of people, bang, you know, can't, can't wait to get out? I don't know if I buy that picture either, so. Yeah, there's, there's definitely some nuance going on here. Well, the Soviet Union, if it was so inefficient, why did it beat the Americans in basically every other military aerospace race or otherwise arms race? In most cases, practically speaking, beat them in every race following the atomic bomb, which the Americans uh, narrowly beat the Soviets on. But following that, they, they won every race. And they won every race. They, they put the first man high up in the atmosphere, wherever that is. I won't say space, because that's misleading, but they put they put a guy well, far up there first, before the Americans, and the Americans saw that the Soviets were kicking their butts technologically, they were making all the better contraptions and, and airplanes and everything. That encouraged them, in my opinion, to propagate a myth that we went to the moon, that they went, that the Americans went to the moon. And this was at a time in the late 60s when America was increasingly getting bogged down in the Vietnam War. So I don't think it was a coincidence that you would have a cultural myth founded by America, by the one thing that America did so well that always beat the Soviets, which was propaganda and movies and narrative creation, by founding that myth, give the people, give some reason to believe in the American empire again. I guess it did provide that reason, but technologically the reality is that the Soviets always had the superior aerospace industry. The Americans couldn't even build something like the AK-47. The AK-47 machine gun it's far more reliable and effective than the M16 or anything the United States has produced since that time. The Soviet Union was a capable land-based empire, not like a sea empire like America tried to copy Great Britain by being spread out with naval bases around the world. For example, in the war in Ukraine, Russia has the capability to deal with air defense. It has the air defense technology itself ways of shooting down missiles, shooting down planes, or dealing with missiles that are coming from the ground if you want to protect your aircraft. They're the ones that actually have the edge on the Americans who never built their war based on that strategy, on that outlook of needing extensive air defense. So the Soviets really, they won World War II far more than the Americans did. The contribution of the Soviets outweighed what the Americans accomplished in World War II heavily, because that was where the war, at least the war against Germany, was decided primarily by the war in the east as the Russians push back or as the Soviets push back the German invaders. You're seeing mirror images of some aspects of 1943 and the campaigns in the east uh, today in Ukraine in, 19, in 2023, which is interesting because it matches up to the decade. But uh, not to get into numerology, I don't believe in that stuff, but it's, it's an interesting coincidence. And even if you want to bring up extreme examples, like moving away from the Soviet Union, like North Korea, that's the popular example. Are you for North Korea? I mean, North Korea is totalitarian. There's not really any totalitarian state today, unlike North Korea, because even Afghanistan, that's not really the same thing. That's not really the same thing at all. Afghanistan's probably pretty free compared to even Western countries. I bet Afghanistan's like relatively free. Not that that's necessarily a good thing. Not that I would want to go to Afghanistan. North Korea would not be free in the way that we commonly understand the term. But I don't necessarily see the North Korean regime. I'm sure they do evil things. 
and have put people in camps and all sorts of dark things. I, I'm sure that that all happens and that's not good. But are we supposed to think that South Korea is this shining example of they're the good ones and North Korea is the bad ones? I mean, in many ways, South Korea is just as corrupt as the North, wouldn't you say? I mean, what, because they're more materially successful, they're more materially enriched? A materially enriched people is not always a people that is spiritually stronger. I'm not making any judgments, I don't know. One of the main points I would bring up is that the communist countries, or at least the Soviet Union, really all of them, they didn't encourage mass immigration into their borders. Like, they didn't take people from Bangladesh and put them in central Russia. As far as I know, they didn't do stuff like that. They didn't mix people around borders. They did, however, uh, allow and settle ethnic Russians in other parts of the Soviet bloc countries. For example, in Latvia, today. They didn't encourage mass immigration in quite the same way. But I would say that moving ethnic Russians around Eastern Europe, yeah, you're, you're stirring up other people's stuff, but that's not the same thing as moving in Pakistanis or Somalis. It's just not. I think we all know that. So yeah, you're, you're creating a political divide there for a purpose. That's why they encouraged it, to strengthen their, their, poli their political foundation there. But that's not the same thing as the mass immigration we have today. And, and it seems that the Soviets recognize that you can't just treat everyone as a, a global homogenized blob. We have to cooperate with nationalist currents. And they always recognized that they had to celebrate the Russian people and not erase their own foundational base, which was the Russian ethnic people. But at the same time, they led a federation of peoples without as far as I can see, alienating any of the groups too badly. And maybe they did. Too. They alienated some groups today. Obviously, Western Ukrainians don't like, don't like the Russians and other European countries, they don't like the Russians. But I think they did lead the same way that they, they lead a federation today. Like, the Russia today is a federation. And ethnic Russians that we're familiar with, people that look like Vladimir Putin, I mean, they're a majority, I suppose. But, like, Stalin was from Georgia, I believe, or around that area. So he was a different ethnicity. So the Russians were able to preserve the body of their people. The Soviets were able to do that despite all the darkness of communism. They weren't that dumb. They weren't that dumb to just treat everyone as an interchangeable widget on a global mainframe that the contemporary globalists today in the West view their own peoples as. Not even the communists who we demonize, or at least the Soviets, ever thought of their people that way. Maybe that was partly because of their pragmatism. Maybe that was just the Russian people themselves and their thousand-year history rising above these challenges and remaining faithful to their roots in the face of darkness. And as we have seen in the 21st century, rising from the depths of that darkness to strength again. Hasta luego, amigos!